My dear and beloved in Christ, Bishop Fulton J. Sheen said, History is full of men and women who've claimed to be that they were gods, or that they came from God, or that they bore messages from God. And as a result, most of these people founded their own religion. Reason dictates that if anyone actually comes from God or was sent by him, his claim must be supported by God, who would pre-announce his coming and let us know when and where he would be born, where he would live, the doctrine he would teach, the enemies he would make, the program he would adopt for the future, and the manner of his death. Specific predictions and expectations concerning a Redeemer who would be sent by God can be found in 34 prophecies of the Old Testament and also in the history of the Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. The Gentile writers who noted the expectation of such a person include Cicero, Virgil, Suetonius, Plato, Socrates, and Confucius. As far distant as China, there was an expectation of the great wise men who would be born in the East. And it's, this is in the annals of the celestial empire, China, and it can complain, contain this statement. It talked about, in the 24th year of the Chao Wing, the dynasty of Chao, the eighth day of the fourth moon, a light appeared in the southwest, which illumined the king's palace. The monarch, struck by its splendor, interrogated the sages. They showed him books in which his prodigy signified the appearance of the great saint of the West, whose religion was to be introduced into their country. Of all the claimants of divinity, there is only one who has fulfilled every prophecy, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus, our Redeemer, was promised and characterized by certain unmistakable marks. From a historical view alone, there is presented a uniqueness which sets Christ apart from the founders of the world religions. No other can make such a claim as Christ did or even come close to fulfilling the marks of the promised one. No other religious founder or claimant has had his birth foretold. The details concerning his mother and birthplace predicted or how he would die. None of the information and accounts concerning any one of them was recorded centuries before he was born. Furthermore, not one of them came into this world to die. They came to live. My dearly beloved in Christ, many who recognize Christ do so only to the extent of admitting that he was merely a great prophet, but no more. Christ, however, proved that he was not only man, but also God. He claimed himself as such and proved it by the miracles he performed, his prophecies, and by his very own words. Only God can perform miracles, and Christ himself appealed to his miracles when he said, Though you do not believe me, believe the works. Holy Scripture records multitudes of miracles that Christ performed. Others work miracles in the name of God, or in the name of Jesus. But Christ, by his own power, worked them. His greatest miracle was when he raised himself from the dead on Easter Sunday. Aside from his miracles, Christ on many occasions verbally claimed he was indeed the Son of God. In Holy Scripture we read, Christ claimed to have the same nature as the Father when he said, I and the Father are one. He attributed eternity to himself and he told the Jews, before Abraham came to be, I am. In both cases, the Jews wanted to stone him because they considered him guilty of blasphemy, thus showing that they understood him to mean exactly what he said. My dearly beloved in Christ, in Holy Scripture, we're also told that Christ's power and authority are equal to that of the Father. We read, for whatever he does, this the Son also does in like manner. As the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he will, that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. As the Father has life in himself, even so is he given to the Son to have life in himself. Jesus further proved he was God 
by forgiving sins. When Jesus was about to heal a certain paralytic, he first said to him, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. At once the Jews accused him of blasphemy, for God alone can forgive sins. Thereupon, Jesus asked the question, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk? Of course, neither of these is easier, for both call for the exercise of divine power. And so Jesus continued, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, I say to thee, arise, take up thy pallet, and go to thy house. And immediately the health of the sick man was restored. Since many of the people took Jesus for one of the great prophets, he asked the apostles on a certain occasion whom they thought him to be. Then St. Peter, in the name of the other apostles, made the solemn declaration, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus accepted this clear profession of his divinity as he answered, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to thee, but my Father in heaven. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. During Christ's passion, when he was brought to trial before Caiaphas, the high priest, there was confusion because the testimony of the false witnesses did not agree. Caiaphas then turned to Jesus with this solemn question. I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus answered with equal solemnity, thou hast said it, which is the same as saying, I am. And enlarging on what he had said, he continued, therefore I say to you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power of God and coming upon the clouds of heaven. The words of Jesus are unmistakable. And the high priest ran his garment as he cried out, He has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? What do you think? And he answered and said, He is liable to death. My dear beloved in Christ, the strength of Christ's testimony lies in the fact that he wrought countless miracles during his life, that he rose from the dead, and that the Catholic Church and her victorious march through the centuries is the standing proof of the truth of Christ's prophecies that the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Since Christ is truly the Son of God, his teaching and his church are true and final. It would be indeed foolish and detrimental to our soul to find any philosophy, opinion, or self-proclaimed theory of science which deviates in any way from Christ's teaching and that of the magisterium of his church. Our Lord's credentials have been proved to be valid and indisputable. Outside the Catholic Church, all other religions are utterly hopeless and false. If we nevertheless choose to go along with anyone or any group which rejects any part or all of what Christ has taught as preserved by his church, then our logic and reasoning is truly faulty or has been darkened by pride. Such people or groups delude themselves and others with, with lies, hiding their heresy while still operating under the title Catholic. Since Christ is truly God, his teachings are true and final and are not up for convenient alteration or abrogation. We cannot pick and choose. Christ's commandments are not mere counsels that may be accepted or rejected at pleasure. His authority is universal. There's no power on earth which has the right to interfere with the work of the church or to limit or control her in the mission given her by him. My dear and beloved in Christ, the authority of the Catholic Church is supreme in all matters of faith and morals. She is the divinely appointed court to pronounce on the moral aspects of all human affairs and not confined to teaching a few practices to the faithful. Since Christ is God, then in him alone can salvation be found. My dearly beloved in Christ, God will not force us in this life to submit to Christ's authority. 
The choice is ours, but which choice we make will decide our place for all eternity. I'd like to close with this story. One day, a priest who had had many enthronements in his parish was called to the rectory door by a sobbing woman who asked him to pray for her husband. He was, she said, very sick and in fact dying, but he had refused to see a priest. The woman begged Father to pray for her, for him. I'll do that, he answered, but I'll do more. I'm coming to your home to hear his confession. But Father, you can't do that. He won't see a priest. In fact, he curses at the mention of having a priest in the home. Please, just pray for him. Oh, woman, where's your faith? replied the priest. Did I not promise in the day I enthroned the sacred heart in your home, even though your husband was not there, that if you trusted in the sacred heart and frequently renewed your act of consecration, he would not allow your husband to die without the sacraments? Well, he will keep his promise. Now go home, kneel down before the sacred heart with your children, and renew your act of consecration. The woman promised to do what the priest had asked. The same day he came to the home, the weeping wife met him at the door. Trust the sacred heart, she was reminded. Pray to him while I go see your husband. When the priest entered the dying man's room, he found the patient on, con on oxygen, but conscious. Putting on the purple stall, he asked the two nurses in attendance to leave the room. Approaching the bedside of the dying sinner, he asked the man if he'd like to make his peace with God and go to confession. The answer was an affirmative nod of his head. Grace had conquered, a miracle indeed. The priest told the good news to the wife in the next room. She was beside herself with joy. In the meantime, the nurses returning to the sick room at once summoned the priest. Father, one of them asked, what did you do to him? What did I do? Why? Why? I simply heard his confession, anointed him, and prepared him to die. Father was the reply, go look at him. Returning to the sick room, the priest was surprised to see the dying man, now sitting up in bed, completely changed in appearance. The priest could hardly believe his eyes. He concluded his story by saying, I had promised the man that I would return with the Blessed Sacrament on the following day, but believe it or not, on the following day, he walked to the church and received Holy Communion beside his wife and children. How much this reminds us of the story of the man crippled with palsy and lowered into the room before Jesus. In both cases, neither had asked to have his sins forgiven. But not only was this granted them, but each was restored to health. Such is the love and mercy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. How faithful he is to his promises and how much he rewards our faith and trust in him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.